booktube and welcome to a new video. This is my Friday reads for three books. Loped by Shola von Reinhold. Poetry Collection, The Malevolent Volume by Justin Philip Reed. I think I'm going to uh, link these to some extent. This is uh, from Britain, from Glasgow. This is from America, but both are really dealing with uh, blackness and queerness. So I think there is a link there. And finally, a graphic novel, Asterios Polyp. We'll start with Lote. So, Shona von Reinhold, this is a debut novel, uh, an author from Glasgow in Scotland, um, black and queer, and identifies as they. Uh, and this is a book really about blackness and queerness in society and in art in particular and the erasure of both as you know regarded as outsiders to the point of as I say erasure by sort of dominant white culture so Matilda and that we'll have to call her that because she's an escape artist who has left behind the life that would have been carved out for her in her community because she is very much as I say, outside that, both in terms of uh, working class, and she has a very sort of aesthetic sensibility, which would otherwise get sort of ground out of her. Uh, she's black, and uh, although her sexuality is never really um, explored in here, in fact, there's very little sex in here, um, she is queer in that sense of outside, outsiderness from, from the dominant culture. And she has escaped as a teenager with her male friend Malachi and she is constantly sort of escaping and reinventing herself and renaming herself. And when the book starts she has volunteered to be uh, a, an archivist for the uh, National Portrait Gallery and it has a, an annex uh, in a sort of decommissioned gentleman's club. Uh, where she and another elderly black woman are going through these sort of donated photo collections and sort of sifting them out, trying to sort of date them and, and, and say who's, you know, who the, uh, who the people in the photos are uh, on behalf of the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, and it's, you know, it's already transgressive because, you know, here are two women in a gentleman's club, who, of course, women never would have been admitted when it was open. Uh, and they're not only women, but they're black women. And again, these gentlemen's clubs tend to be for whites. So already it's transgressive. And she steals a photo, one of the photos, because she has a series of what she calls transfictions, which are sort of, I suppose you could sort of say, ob obsessions on people, certain people and artists and outsiders, you know, throughout recent history, well, I say recent, uh, sort of 19th century, early 20th century history. And she is interested in one of the sort of last great sort of dandies called Stephen Tennant. And it's for a period that runs from Oscar Wilde, The Young British Things, to um, the Bloomsbury set. So that's the period that she's interested in. And this guy, Stephen Tennant, you know, only existed uh, really as sort of a self-ornament. He sort of displayed himself at sort of parties and social events and stuff. And she spots a photo with him in, but what she's more drawn to in this photo is there's a black woman uh, wearing uh, wings, a sort, of, sort of a costume party. And she finds out that this woman was called Hermia Druitt, and she becomes sort of added to her Parthenon of uh, transfictions. And transfictions is an interesting word because they are sort of fixations in the sense of obsessions, but it's also like a, a fix, like a drug fix, because they send her into sort of ecstatic trances when she's sort of uh, thinking about them and trying to place herself in their world and such is that state that you know she has to sleep for ages afterwards so that's the thing about about her she is such an outsider that you know although she's volunteered for this archival work you know she doesn't work she exists by sort of shoplifting or sort of scams um and she's you know, she sleeps a lot. She she really is outside of society of, of you know how most people go about living their lives. And I think that you know that's a really interesting. You know, I've seen that done in a lot of books. Lee Rourke's character, you know, protagonists, or they all sort of are, don't have jobs or they walk out on their jobs. But I think this book is very good at saying, well, how would that work? What would that look like? How do you still, you know, make enough money to survive and stuff? And I think that's really well done here as part of her escape act. I think that's well. I think that's well detailed here. 
Anyway, as part of um, her researches into Druid, she finds out that she spent a time in this European city called Dun, D-U-N, and she sort of d never heard of it. And she goes online and finds that, you know, that there's a lot of kind of scam stuff in its name. But there's also this sort of arts residency uh, in the town of Dun, uh, which is paid as a sort of stipend. So she sort of applies for it. And uh, when she hits submit, it sort of says, thank you, 2007. So, you know, it's she thinks, oh, I've completely wasted my time because, you know, we're way beyond 2007. But it turns out that you know eventually that she's she she's offered a place on the residency so she leaves london and goes to this place called dun and it's based it's it's an artist residency and it's based around the theories of an artist called gavaro who probably doesn't exist who invented what he called um, thought art which is a anti-capitalist in a way, almost anti-art. It's not anti-art, although it does it does sort of intersect a bit with sort of destructive art, where sort of artworks are made and then sort of, you know, destroyed, burned or whatever, and then, you know, the file exhibiting the ashes of the artwork. It does intersect with that, but it's more about art, art that will never have an audience. And these are the theories of this guy, Gavro, and it's, you know, there's some potty jargon and stuff. And again, right from the beginning, uh, she rejects this because she's come to Dunn to see if she can find out more about her, her Maya Druitt. And it does intersect with the work, with the, um, with the, with the life of, of Gavro and stuff. Um, but that, and this is the bulk of the book of her time at Dunn and on this res residency, whose principles she's rejected almost from the outset. You know, she's completely rebelled. Um, she's, you know, the, the, the theories of Gavreau are sort of anti-aesthetic, uh, anti-beauty, because they're not meant to be seen, anti-capitalist, all these sorts of things, whereas she's interested in decadence, ornamentation, and, you know, the place of, of, of black men and women, you know, in this period from the late 19th century through to the early, early 20th, uh, and their erasure uh, by white culture. Uh, so for an example of that, uh, she comes across uh, a painting of uh, a black model who is, and the painting is called The Statue. And it's clearly not a statue. It's clearly a black sitter has sat for the artist and been painted as flesh, as black flesh, but has been erased because it's talked about, it's, it's titled The Statue, as if, you know, this isn't flesh, this is black marble or, you know, another black, a uh, black rock. Um... You know, Hermia Druitt herself, you know, wrote a book of poetry which has completely disappeared um, because, again, black art, and going back to the older woman that she was working with in the, in the archive back in London, her whole campaign is to reinstate black artists and black art which has been erased by the dominant culture. So it sort of fit, it fits in with that. Um, and... It's very much a, a sort of consideration of the role of ornamentation in art and how important it was for black artists who, who you know, who didn't have the official channels of being published readily or, or whatever. Um, but they made a display of themselves. They made an artwork of themselves long before this sort of young British artists of, you know, Damien Hirst and Tracy Emin, whose lives are their art. You know, these black, art, these black artists were doing it because that was the only way you know, that they were allowed any existence, you know, every every time that Hermia drew it turned up, you know, people asked her, are you Josephine Baker? You know, because all black people obviously looked the same, you know, in, in the late 19th century. And Josephine Baker was someone, because of her skiing voice, was very much sort of on the, on the party circuit. So for another black person to be admitted on the party circuit, it must be Josephine Baker. You know, this 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 is the kind of the thinking. And this book is a fantastic meditation on aesthetics and art and blackness and queerness and outsiderness. You know, it asks the question, is there within all human beings an aesthetic sense built on natural harmony, symmetry, mathematics, all this sorts of thing, in the same way as is there an objective reality or... Is it purely acculturated, you know, subjective according to the individual's own experience? And where do, you know, where do black artists sit on this spectrum? 
because if there is a universal aesthetic within all human beings, because the way our brains are structured and we, we respond to symmetry and harmony and all this sort of stuff, then black artists should be contributing to that. Whereas if there isn't, then do they only make art for a black sensibility? And of course it's a spectrum and the book is, is very nuanced on you know, the stages of that spectrum. So it's a really, really interesting book. I think for me personally, it did go slightly on too long in this setting of Dunn and this residency. It, you know, it did sort of drag a little bit at times during, during that, because you were interested in the journey, the more discovery about Hermia Druitt, rather than the drinking escapades of the various characters in here, for example. Uh, I'm just going to read you two two bits to you know to give you a notion of how good the writing is and and how ideas are presented and dealt with uh, in a I think a very um, developed way here. So here she's offering uh, two different types of uh, sort of personality. One is called Arcadian and one is called Utopian. Um, these non-existent beams, held up from the non-existent tree-fringed and flickering bodies of water, were the perfectly normal sensational offshoots of gazing at photos all day. There were no act that there were access to glimpses of Arcadia, the grand ahistorical mythical paradise, which is the ultimate project of all Arcadian personality types, who crave a paradise knit out of visions of the past, much like their more illustrious cousins Utopians do with the future. It, paradise, is ultimately to be a collaboration. Utopian personality types, as a rule, find old things redolent of decay and can just about put up with new things which are still not of the future. The classic counterpart traits of the Arcadian, like a fondness for old objects and buildings and an inclination towards historicised figments, were, as far as I was concerned, much easier to inhabit for white people who continued to cast and curate all the ready-made, ready-to-hand visions. Being born in a body that's apparently historically impermissible, however, only meant I was not as prone to those traps that lie in wait for Arcadians, the various and insidious forms of history worship and past lust. I would not get thrown off track. I would rove over the past and seek out the lost detail to contribute to the great constitution, exhume a dead beautiful feeling, discover a wisp of radical attitude pickled since antiquity revive revolutionary but lustrous sensibilities long perished. So I think that's a really good statement of, first of all, debate in art. You know, when the futurists launched their manifestos, they were very much about the future. And then other artists pointed out, well, that, that, that in a way, they're just as nostalgic only for something that hasn't happened yet, for a future. And I, I, so there's that terms in terms of the artistic debate, but it's a fantastic statement, a part of what makes up sort of um, racist conservative thinking in you know these visions of the past which probably never even existed but even if they did they certainly can't be recreated in the modern age and she's straddling a path between the two you know adopting elements of the two so she you know she's looking back to these elements from the age of decadence uh you know so she's very much arcadian in that sense but she wants to do it in a revolutionary way to re introduce and re-establish the role of blackness and queerness that have been suppressed from those past records and bring them to the light, you know, going forward, going to the future. So, you know, really, really sort of interesting stuff. And then this is another one. This is talking about the, the nature of, uh, you know, the, the, the great escape uh, that started all this off for her and Malachi. Once set, we conducted in tandem the self-extraction from our given lives, our first and only joint escape. And almost magically it worked. We had been lucky. Spindle-limbed, ganache-skinned, very young. We had been palatable enough at that moment to scale the heights of a group so far removed from where we had just come from that we became dizzy. One of the first things Malachi and I learnt was that, as miserly as they are, rich people will happily prop up their own kind for years. If they, however, discover they are suspending someone not of their own kind unwittingly dangling them by a thread, they will start to feel charitable, which is one of their most violent and short-lived states. Giddy with benevolence, they soon feel indebted beyond all possible recompense, but it is not that which does it. They finally become obsessed with the knowledge of this dangling, 
not truly convinced anyone they know could actually have no safety net, and so they cut the thread. So I think that's a brilliant, short piece of class analysis. You know, wonderful, wonderful stuff. So, as I say, my only slight uh, letdown was that there was less of that and more sort of plots and detail of daily lives um, in that sort of long, long section set in done. But anyway, a really good book, 4.5 4 stars. And on to uh, the, male the malevolent volume, Justin Philip Reed, as I say, a collection of poetry. Um, it, in some ways, um, my favourite sort of uh, black queer poet is Denny Smith, and his work is very urban. It's very set in the now. It's very much about relationships, uh, whereas this is is sort of one step removed. It's 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 slightly more. Um, I can't say universalised because it's talking about sort of blackness and queerness and outsiderness, but it's it's not as specifically located as Denny Smith. And the other collection of poetry, Aimé Cesar's um, collection, Lost Body, uh, which is about negritude. Now there, that, you know, Cesar works in... There, he's from Martinique, you know, the Caribbean island. And the negritude that he's looking to um, to use to sort of put forward is of the island's, uh, you know, trees and birds and stuff. There's a slightly sort of... I mean, it's dark. There are dark there's sort of darkness underneath it. But it's very much a sort of um, idyllic and sort of beauty and harmony. This is far darker. This is crows and ravens and gravestones um, and the, the sort of the hunt and spirits, but not not sort of the specific spirits of voodoo or some other sort of African spiritualism. It's just the spirits of the dead that sort of haunt this. And I think, again, you know, that. The easiest thing is if I just read a poem. I will say he uses a technique very effectively, which is uh, breaks between stanzas, but the, the you know they're run on. So so the the previous stanza, you know, halfway through the line, it's not completed, and then it's completed after the the spatial break in the beginning of the next stanza, which gives it an urgency and a rhythm, which I think is very very effective. So this is a poem called What's Left Behind After a Hawk Has Seized a Smaller Bird Midair. I'm not going to read the whole poem. I've seen what's left behind after a hawk has seized a smaller bird midair. The feathers lay circled in prattle with rotting crab apples, grasses passing between the entrances and exits of clover. The raptor somewhere over it, over it. Cruelty where? The hell would grief go in a goshawk? It's enough to risk the open field, its rotten crab apples, grasses passing out like lock kneed mourners in sun. There I was, scoping, scavenging, the damage to drag a mystery out of a simple reed. Two animals wanted life enough to risk the open field, and one of them took what it hunted. Each one tells me he wants me vulnerable. I already wrote that book. The body text cleave to the spine, simple to read as two animals wanting to see inside each other, and one pulling back a wing to offer, see, here, the fastest way in or out, and you know, you knew how it would end. You cleave the body text to the spine, cause you read closely, you clock damage. It was a door you walked through once, before pivoting towards a newer image of risk. So again, very effective, 4.5. And finally, to the graphic novel, novel A Stereos Polyp uh, by David Mazzuccelli. Uh, I don't read a lot of graphic novels, but uh, Guilty Feet uh, recommended this, and very fine it is too. So A Stereos Polyp is uh, a middle-aged man who is an architecture lecturer at university, uh, divorced, uh, but has sort of quite a comfortable life, but is rather... He's rather up himself. He's rather one of those people who believes that their view is always the correct one. And the book opens with a lightning storm and it strikes his building and his building goes on fire. And that sets off a whole sort of set of events where Polyp up and leaves his job at the university, slaps down some money on uh, the counter at the Greyhound bus station and says, OK, well, take me uh, as far as... The, you know, in America, as, as the, this money will buy a ticket to. And the bus uh, lets him off at the town of Apogee, which is an astronomical term for the point at which the moon is furthest away from the from the Earth. 
and uh, you know obviously he gets himself a job with a car mechanic and uh, the car mechanic uh, has got a house uh, has got a room to, to let so uh, he moves in with him and his wife who's a bit of a shaman and their young kid and that's basically the plot but that's not what's you know that's not what the book's about the book is about binary uh, pairs and uh, binary opposites because uh, Asterios was uh, a twin in the womb, but at birth his twin died. And there's always that's why you always see him in profile, as if he's one half of a of a two of a you know a united being who we obviously we never we never really uh, you know get a sense of. There's only a couple of times in the book where you know we we do see him sort of full frontal. Um, so there are all sorts of, as I say, binary pairs, binary opposite, binary opposites. So the notion of Dionysian versus Apollonian, you know, sort of uh, chaos and, and sort of sensuousness versus order and rationality. Uh, there's the binary pairs uh, of man and woman, male, female, husband and wife, because a lot of this book is a is a, him sort of recollecting uh, back on on his marriage uh, with, with a younger female artist. Uh, which eventually gets ground down because, as I say, he, you know, he's someone who always thinks he's, he's right, and it's, in the end it wears her down. Um, other binary pairs, such as, you know, is, is there an objective reality, which I talked about in, in Lote, or is it all a social construction of each individual's uh, brain, so that there's a, you know, that we're all solipsistic beings, and can there be any bleed from one, to, one across to the other? So, as I say, all these all these binary pairs and binary opposites, which I think are ultimately his his downfall, um, that, that that account for his character and why he's gone on this strange journey and what he finds, and again it comes back to the central image of he was parted from his twin at birth. There's always that missing half that he doesn't have access to, you know, he doesn't have access to it ultimately with the women that he's with. Um, and um, you know why? I re apart from the ideas that are going on in this book, what I really like about it is is the visuals. So the first thing to say is it's quite simple. You know, big big frames laid out on the page, uh, very uh, simple colouring. And you know, one of the things I like about it is that each chapter has a different tint or tone. So this chapter is all yellow. That's all sort of mauvey. Uh, we've got one coming up in red or pink or whatever, and it's, I found that really effective, really simple and striking and effective. But the, the, the great thing about the artwork is that there's all these sort of motifs, visual motifs, just off, you know, on the peripheries, just off the central focus. So, for example, a bedspread with the double helix of DNA, that sometimes that uh, Stereos himself is portrayed as made up of pl um, platonic solids. So there obviously is a, is a normal human drawing, but then there'll be one of, you know, the solids that go up to make, to make him. And then there's like a party, uh, an academic party, and all the different uh, professors are portrayed according to their, you know, their specialism. So there's a, a you know, the English professor is, is done just as a series of letters and, and things like that. So there's a lot of really, really enticing, alluring little details that just go up to make the greater whole I think there's a lot to ponder on the ending's a bit strange because I managed to follow it all the way through and I will say I read all this in one sitting even though it's about 350 pages it's a you know it's an easy read again there were not that many frames on each page don't forget um but the ending was a bit a bit you know I couldn't quite work out the ending and obviously I can't talk about it in any detail Two of the women portrayed in here are fabulous, being his wife, the artist, and also the shaman woman, who's absolutely fascinating. Um, so, yeah, this was a great read. Uh, so very thanks to Guilty Feet for the recommendation. Five stars. So that is what I've completed. Uh, what I'm currently reading is Larry Kramer, The American People, Volume 2, The Brutality of Fact, which uh, I've started slightly early because it was my February big read. Uh, it comes in about 790 pages, something like that. Uh, I'm only 58 pages in, but the reason I've started it early is because I have a buddy read in February, and obviously I'm not sure at what point and how long, because we haven't had that discussion yet, me and Roxy, uh, at what point in the month we're going to start it and at what pace we're going to read it. So I wanted to ensure that I had the flexibility to, you know, to do that and my big read for the month. So I think that's it. 
Thanks very much. Till next time.